Now, when we study this constitution, when we study the 1978 constitution, um, you need to keep in mind, guys, that uh, as a lesson, this is something you find in the grade 13 syllabus. Now, if you, if there are anyone in this class uh, who are in grade 12 at the moment, who's doing 11, 12, 22, this is going to be a lesson that you all are going to come across quite later in your uh, school or wherever you are to study political science. But it's always good to have this knowledge whenever you can. Now, that this is webinar, I prefer anyone to take part in this and get that knowledge. Because some at, at one point when you are studying this, it is is going to make sense to you because you heard it at one point, right? And since this is a lesson that you are supposed to uh, study uh, quite late in the syllabus, uh, it's actually the twelfth twelfth uh, unit in the entire syllabus. And uh, by that time, you are supposed to be familiar with certain uh, certain other units basics. Um, so, basically, you should know Unit 4, where they teach about uh, the um, formats of governments, presidential systems, cabinet systems, and semi-presidential systems and all that. And you are supposed to have somewhat of an idea of uh, the 1947 and 72 Solberry and uh, First Republican Constitutions. That's like the background basic knowledge you need to understand this uh, lesson thoroughly. However, uh, I will try my best to give you all these basics in a nutshell if you're not aware of those. And, um, and I will try my best to explain these concepts in a way that uh, you all can easily understand. Okay, right. So <clears throat> the presidential system was created by the Americans. Now in the USA, you don't have a prime minister. In the USA, you have a president. That means president is the sole executive. He handles uh, all the uh, all the affairs of the country, and <clears throat> um, the president does not depend on uh, the support of the legislature. Now, the U.S. president doesn't depend on the support of the Congress. U.S. president uh, is appointed by people directly, unlike the prime minister who's appointed through the parliament. Right? You have to get the support of the parliament; they can only appoint as prime minister. Now, the French people sort of created a new one. Which is called the semi-presidential system, or as a mixed executive system, or as a hybrid system. The same thing, the same thing. Basically, they combine both. Saying that the French, the French people were thinking of a constitution, they were like, "Okay, let's see. The British people are having a prime minister who's dependent on the, who's dependent on the legislature. Americans are having a president who is not dependent on the legislature. So why not put both?" Let's put both together and let's have a combined system, which is what the French went ahead with. Okay, so this system was created to assure the advantages of both systems. Now, in the in the presidential system, the executive is very stable. Now, in the USA, the US president doesn't have to depend on what the legislature has to say. So you all saw how how arrogant Donald Trump was as a president, right? It's like the uh, example you all are most familiar. The reason was because that he is independent from the legislature. He was appointed by the people. He was not controlled by the legislature. Right. That means the executive can be stable, but it's not very democratic because the legislature has very little control over the executive. Parliamentary system in the other other way around. Prime ministers are always well controlled by the parliament because your your existence depends. On the support you get from the parliament, the day you lose your support from the parliament, uh, you are basically fired as the prime minister. Your government is no more. And that is very democratic because you can control uh, the leader of your country from being arrogant or being uh, autocratic. But on the other hand, that is very unstable because the prime minister may go to sleep thinking I'm the prime minister and wake up and find out that he's not the prime minister anymore. Okay, so. Um, in the French uh, constitution, they decided to include both. So half of the executive is stable and half of the executive is democratic. So they try to protect both. Now in Sri Lanka also, um, Sri Lanka also had a cabinet system before 1977, 78. 
under Solberry, we were given a cabinet system because it was the British people who conquered us. So they basically gave us what they had been written. And we continued that even with our first constitution in 72. And by like 1960s, the discussion had started that maybe Sri Lanka needs an executive president. And Mr. J.R. Jayavadan was the person who promoted this idea very much because he was a big fan of the USA. Right? Fun fact that uh, his nickname was Dicky. Right? J.R. Jayavadan's nickname was Dicky. He was called Dicky by his friends. And since, since J.R. Jayavadan loved USA so much, his friends used to call him Yankee because he's like a Yank, such a Yankee loves USA so much, right? So um, one of the things that J.R. Javadana loved about the USA was the fact that they had an executive president who was stable. Now, Sri Lanka sustained several government collapses, very premature government collapses, simply because of, uh, simply because of the fact that prime ministers are too dependent on their legislatures, right? Now, example, in 1960, that be Senanayaka in 1960, um, March or February, February. Yeah. So there was an election, and uh, no one had a clear majority. So Ratri Saranaka had to gather so many political parties to create an alliance, which didn't even last one day. So technically, basically, they had one government, one session in the parliament, and a couple of parties left his government. And on the very first day, his government collapsed. So in 1960, we had to have a second parliament election. Because the first government didn't sustain, they only lasted one parliamentary session. And uh, Sirima Bandaranaika became the prime minister, and her government only completed four years out of their five year tenure because um, there was like a power struggle moment um, of Sirima's people sort of failing, some failing to turn up for a vote, and some of them actually shifting their side and going to UNP. Um, and Sirima's government lost. Um, lost uh, one of their acts in the parliament because some people some people were abroad some people could not make it um, one person he was driving all the way from Habutale and he suffered a flat tire in somewhere in Badul or something like that so he couldn't come and uh, I think they were just uh, short of one vote and uh, there was this one person one city mouse supporter who actually went to the bathroom and the door was locked from um, I don't know, outside. And some people say that there were a couple of people who purposely locked him inside, knowing that you know they were one word short. So the end result was, whatever said and done, the end result was that uh, Sri Mao's government lost that uh, act simply with one vote. Sri Mao had 64 votes against her and 63 votes in her favor. So basically, um, Sri Mao's government lost because one person was stuck in the bathroom, right? No kidding. This, this is like a real story. I'm not making this up, right? So you can see how unstable that system is. Simply a person having to take a bathroom break at a wrong time and like a door malfunction. Um, <clears throat> perhaps it wasn't a malfunction like someone locked from outside. But the point is, it was the government of the country, the executive, which fell with a very simple uh, incident like that. So because of that, in 1960s, people, some people were suggesting that Sri Lanka needs an executive president like the US when the person comes to power until the person completes the tenure. It's pretty much practically impossible for this person to be removed, right? So the only way a president can be removed is either by he has to resign or, he, or the person has to die or the person has to be impeached by passing an impeachment. So even if you pass an impeachment, still that person's deputy would take over. Now, when Donald Trump was the president, there was so much uh, talk about impeaching him, passing an impeachment and getting rid of him from the position of president. But no one was that enthusiastic in doing that because just because you impeach Donald Trump doesn't mean you get a new election to choose a new president. If you impeach Trump, Trump's second in command will come to the power. So Mike Pence would have been the president. So they were like, What's the difference? It's pretty much the same person with same policies. And that's why they weren't that interested. But that's how the presidential system works. Once someone comes to power, until the tenure is over, that government won't come to a premature ending. So this is the reason people were suggesting that we need to go for a system like that. Then, um, long story short, what happened after that 
is that in 1970, uh, Sirima Bandaranaika became the prime minister again. And this time, uh, the two people who helped her, two political parties, which helped her was Lanka Samasamaj Party and the Lanka Communist Party. Back then it was the Communist Party of Ceylon. And these two parties were leftist parties. So they were socialist parties, as we discussed on the Monday webinar. Because of that, they wanted to in implement socialist policies in Sri Lanka. And they went with quite strict, rigid socialist policies, uh, which weren't practically properly implemented, which resulted in like an economic downturn in Sri Lanka. And uh, most importantly, it resulted in a huge uh, financial crisis and a food shortage because basically what they did was they closed down all the imports. They said, we are not importing anything from outside of Sri Lanka. We are going to produce everything in Sri Lanka. That way we are going to prevent the cost, like the money of Sri Lanka from going outside, out, out into other countries, right? This, this sounded like a good idea on paper, but practically it didn't really take on too well. So as a result of that, what happened was, um, there was an economic crisis. If you all ask your parents or your grandparents about the life in 1970s, they will share those stories with you all. Now my father tells me that back then um, uh, there was a shortage of bread. So they used to issue a card. You had to go to your Gramanilodari and get a card mentioning and certifying how many members are there in your family. And depending on that, the government decides how many loaves of bread you get. Right? So my father's family had four kids, so like six, six family members. So because of that, they were allowed two loaves of bread for each day. And you have to take that card and go stay in the queue uh, to get bread. So my father said he has to wake up at about four and go and get the bread and come because if the queue is too long, that it's impossible for him to come back with bread and have breakfast and go to school, right? So, so it was a time like that, right? Is that a question? Uh, we have to pay, no but Yes, paying is there. You have to pay. That's there, right? Um, it just you can't buy all the bread you want. You have to pay, and you only allow two loaves of bread, and that that is certified by the government. And especially during this quarantine time, the first quarantine time, like when they opened the shops for like Monday, and people had to go stay in like queues and all. All these elderly people were saying that it reminds them of like the 1970s. So it was like that. So because of this, people were quite unhappy with Sirimao's government and the government lost its popularity very soon. And as a result, in 1977, J.R. Javadana's uh, UNP, United National Party, came to power with an overwhelming majority of a 5-6 majority, 5-6 power in the parliament. There were 168 members in the uh, legislature. And J.R. Javadar managed to get 141 out of those uh, members. And anyway, J.R. Javadar had promised to come up with a new constitution as, as he gets power. And um, he was supposed to create a constitution in 1977. That's why in 1978, he came up with the Second Republican Constitution of Sri Lanka. And now that he had received five, a 5-6 five, majority, is a huge majority that he pretty much had his liberty to create any constitution he wants. And finally, he brought, he brought in what he always admired and in his opinion, but the missing link between Sri Lanka and development. Right? According to him, this was the reason Sri Lanka was not properly developing, not having political stability because we don't have a political uh, uh, stability because we don't have uh, a stable executive. That's why he introduced the executive presidency in Sri Lanka. Okay. So the 17th, 18th, 19th amendments to this constitution are about president's position. So you can't really understand these amendments without knowing what the president's position is. Okay. So that's why we need to study about this position. So just uh, if you all want to jot down this as like a like a basic idea, if I give you like a map of this lesson we are going to study today. This is what it means. First of all, you need to know what the 1978 president is. What sort of president, what sort of powers, what sort of a role the executive president plays in the 1978 constitution. 
and the seven the seventeenth amendment to the nineteen seventy eight constitution reduced president's powers. Eighteenth amendment increased those powers again, and the nineteenth amendment reduced those powers again. And recently, we passed the twentieth amendment, which increased the powers again. Right. So that's basically a mind map for you all. The original position of the president was very powerful. 17th Amendment reduced the powers, 18th Amendment increased the powers, 19th Amendment again reduced the powers, and the 20th Amendment again increased the powers, right? Now, for people who studied before the 2020 batch and the above people, they only had to study 17th, 18th, and 19th Amendments. The ones who are doing in 2021, uh, also in 2022 or so, you all on, we'll only have to mention the 20th Amendment in like one paragraph in your answers because that's not officially in your syllabus. But like whoever studying the next, uh, perhaps like ones who are doing 2023, 24, those people will have to study the 20th Amendment as well as a part of their syllabus, right? As the time goes by, more amendments you have to study, right? Um, <clears throat> uh, when it comes to these amendments, 13th Amendment discusses 13th Amendment discusses um, it provides for uh, devolution of power in Sri Lanka, which is done through provincial councils. 17th, 18th and 19th Amendments are about the power of the president. Okay. So uh, in order to understand this, you all need to know the timeline of how these amendments came. And what was the political background now? Again, when it comes to uh, some notes or some sources, they only talk about what these amendments were and they don't really, really teach you what was the political background under this. So it's a little difficult to memorize that. So I'm going to give you all what was the political background behind each of these amendments. With that way, you'll be able to memorize this in a better way. Right? So before that, we need to be familiar with what sort of a role the president has to play in the 78th constitution. So if you have this note, which I sent in the group, you will have a printout, which would be better, right? Just go through this note, okay? Right, so let's see. <clears throat> the 1978 constitution gives the position of the executive president. Why does it say like that? I'm going to just clarify all the doubts you all have uh from now itself because uh i don't want to leave any confusion anywhere it introduced the position of the executive president in 1972 in the constitution there was a position called the president that was not the executive president we are talking about now that was a nominal president okay mr william gopal was the first president of sri lanka under the 1978 constitution which meant that he was a nominal president because we still had a prime minister system under that Right? So in the 78th constitution, they introduced, this word is important, executive president. Now, please note that even the term executive president is not entirely accurate because even the previous president was somewhat a part of the executive. But just to differentiate the two positions, we use the word executive here to clarify the fact that this person was not nominal. After 1978, president was the main role. President was the one who handled the steering wheel of the country. Right. Therefore, under the Second Republican Constitution, it is provided uh, that the president is the head of the state, head of the executive, head of the government, and head of the armed forces. All four positions. Right. So, um, if you all haven't learned this when you all study the fourth unit, <clears throat> this is something you all should know. <clears throat> now that you all know, so now that you all know, so. There are four main positions in every country. Head of the executive, head of the government, head of the uh, executive, and head of the armed forces. So head of the state means, like, you know, Rajanaya, the first citizen of the country. Who is the head of the state, being the first citizen of the country. Then head of the executive. Head of the executive means, you know, there's an executive in the country, right? So uh, you are the head of that. Then you have head of the government, the entire government. You are considered as a leader of the government. 
and armed forces. There are forces like army and everything in the country. You are the uh, chief commanding officer. Even the army is supposed to follow your orders. Now, why is it mentioned here that the executive president gets all four? Because in a prime minister system, hear me out here, guys. Concentrate and hear me out. This is an interesting fact. In a prime minister system, only the prime minister only gets head of the government only this. Right? Other three goes to the nominal executive. Under the 1972 constitution, Sirimo Bandarai was only the head of the government. Head of the state, head of the executive, and the chief commanding officer of armed forces was the nominal president, William Gopakar. Right. So under the 1978 constitution, this was changed because in a mixed executive system or a, uh, or a uh, presidential system, all four comes to the president. Okay. Now, as I told you guys, the prime minister system is followed in Great Britain. <coughs> Presidential system is followed in the USA, and it was in uh, in the French Constitution that they combined these two into the same system. And in Sri Lanka, although J R Jayaraman wanted to go all full board presidential, uh, he realized that that would be a too much of a transition because we were so used to having the cabinet system. So instead of going like full full presidential, uh, all all on. Uh, full board presidential like the US, uh, JR decided to go like France, where you keep half cabinet and half president. Right. Now let's carry on with the North. <clears throat> According to the original constitution, uh, before amendments, the official term of the president is six years. And the president could hold the position for a maximum of two terms. The president was chosen in a presidential election where the entire country is considered as one electorate. The winner should receive an absolute majority. Okay, so just uh, we'll leave the election system aside because that's a separate uh, separate lesson. Uh, what is important here is the fact that originally the constitution allowed the president to be president for six years. And the president could hold the position for a maximum of two years. Once you have served two terms, that you were not eligible to run for the presidential election again. The reason this is mentioned there because these two things were changed uh, in pretty much um, most of the amendments that we should study. Right? These things are changed later. Right? Then what does it say? According to the original constitution, the president had the power to appoint ministers, appoint deputy ministers, appoint top positions in the public sector, determine subjects in ministries, remove ministers, etc. Therefore, it can be seen that president had, had complete dominance over the executive. The president was also considered as a minister since he also kept several ministries. Therefore, in general, the president uh, held finance and defense ministries mostly. Right now, during the war time, did we have a defense minister, a separate defense minister? No, we had a defense secretary. Gota Rajapaksha was the defense secretary at that time. Uh, he was the secretary of the ministry because the defense minister was uh, the president Mahindra Rajapaksha himself. Even the finance minister was president Mahindra Rajapaksha himself. If you have like currency notes which were issued in like from 2005 to 2014. Just che check, uh, they are signed by Mahindra Rajapaksha and after that it is mentioned in the Minister of Finance. Okay. These, these were uh, removed only when the, the Yahapal and a good governance government came uh, because Maitri Pala was like a non-party candidate. Uh, he was not given the finance ministry. That's why Ravi Gonaraik and Bangladesh Samadhi were given financial ministry. Uh, interns and the defense ministry was also given to someone else uh, at times. Okay, in general, the president keeps these ministries in his hand, right? So, so you can see that president had the complete dominance over the other ministers. He can appoint ministers, he can remove ministers, he can appoint the prime minister, he can determine what subjects in ministries, right? Now, there are instances in Sri Lankan politics, I don't want to mention. But I should understand the president I'm talking about, right? 
there were some precedents that uh, he had some of his family members and his uh, separate people who were loyal to him. There were people who were loyal to him specifically in the government. And there was a time that although he appointed a lot of ministers, uh, some of the important subjects were not there in those ministries. Now, if I give that as an example, now imagine in this class, okay? Imagine in this class that I want to appoint, let's say now I have Shamil here, right? Shamil is in this class. So I, let's say Shamil is uh, loyal to me, okay? He is like one of my uh, closest uh, allies, okay? So, um, let's say that I want to appoint ministers and um, let's pick someone else. There's someone else that I should appoint as a minister. Let's say Niruni, that I want to appoint Niruni also as a minister. But let's say Niruni is not necessarily, I don't feel like she's loyal to me. So I'm going to appoint Niruni as the um, minister of housing. Okay, minister of housing. But when you appoint her as the minister of housing, the subject of um, the apartment complexes and housing in the urban areas. That's like the most important area in the ministry. So I am going to decide that the apartments and urban housing should come under the urban development ministry instead of the house housing, ministry, right? And I put that in, uh, and I put Shamil as the minister of uh, urban development. So that way I made sure, although I have given Nirunia so like a big ministry, although it appears big, I have taken all the important subjects and I have given it to, to a different ministry where I have put some, one of my uh, loyal people. Okay. So this is exactly what happened uh, in governments in Sri Lanka as well, because uh, there were times that the president would appoint uh, ministers and uh, the changing meddling with these subjects and there were instances this was like very recent there were instances of uh, things like the lottery board <clears throat> the lottery board being a part of the foreign ministry which made no absolute absolutely no sense whatsoever what does the lottery board has anything to do with the foreign ministry it just turned out to be uh, the the Foreign minister used to be the finance minister at one point, and there were like a lot of money in this uh, lottery board. So when he, his ministry changed, he wanted to take that bulk of money, that institute that carries a lot of money with him. So he asked the president to change that. Like, uh, it's okay that you are changing me from finance minister to foreign minister, but can you can you change this uh, this subject to my ministry as well? So the president was capable of doing that. So you can see the president pretty much, he has like, he has one of these like uh, magic wands that he can change anything in the executive, right? <clears throat> then let's take a look at the president and the parliament. The president originally had the power to summon, prologue and dissolve the parliament of his, on his discretion, except a few restrictions such as the parliament not completing one year, or an impeachment against the president being scheduled in the parliament agenda, the president had the power to dissolve the parliament on his discretion. Okay, so president could dissolve the parliament whenever he wanted on his discretion. Let's say the parliament is like perfectly fine. There is no problem with like the majority support or anything. No issue. Like let's say it's a very peaceful parliament which is going perfectly fine. But the president can wake up on one fine day and like some more in the morning while having. Uh, while getting off the bed, he can just, you know, call um, the, the government press and say, you know, issue a gazette saying, I have dissolved the parliament. And if you ask, you'll be like, oh, you know what, I just feel like dissolving the parliament. That was possible, actually. So I'm not kidding. That was possible at one point. The constitution simply said, whenever president seems necessary, whenever the president felt like the, the parliament should be dissolved, he could just be like, oh, you know what, I'll dissolve the parliament. Uh, in 2004, when Ranil Vikramasinghe was the prime minister, right? Chandrika Bandana was the president, who was from the other party. Now, that's a different topic again, like how in Sri Lanka, how the in Sri Lanka system you can get a prime minister and a president from two different parties. 
uh, that's called a cohabitation government. So it's a different lesson you are supposed to study after this. So at that time, Ranil Vikram Singh had 136 people in his favor. Now you just need 113 to form a government. So Ranil Vikram Singh had 136 in his side. That means he was just 14 short of a two-third majority, one of the most strongest parliaments in the recent history, right? But Chandrika Bandaraka just dissolved it with using the powers she had. It, the president was allowed to be, of doing that. The only two restrictions, only two restrictions. One is the parliament not completing one year. What does that mean? If the parliament is new, if the parliament hasn't completed one year since its like inaugural session, then the president can't be sold. And the other thing is, if there is an impeachment against the president included in the agenda, Right. If there is a if there is an impeachment, uh, which is already included in the parliamentary agenda, you know, an impeachment is basically a suggestion to remove the president. Right. So if that's the case, president can't dissolve the parliament. That's all. Okay. Other than that, president could dissolve whenever he wanted. Then it says, additionally, the president had the power to pass any law rejected by the parliament. Therefore, it can be seen that parliament was also dominated by the power of the president. The president had the power to pass any law rejected by the parliament. How? It isn't mentioned here, so you all may take down notes. How? He can call a referendum. If you all have heard something called a referendum, the president can call for a referendum and get the law passed, which was rejected by the parliament. Right? In the public sector and the judiciary, the president originally had the powers of all major positions, this endured, uh, endured uh, the dominance of the president over the judiciary uh, and the public sector as well, right? Now, uh, the original powers of the president mentioned that the president could appoint, pretty much appoint uh, all the top positions, which includes the president could appoint uh, the Chief Justice and all the judges of the Supreme Court, uh, the President of the Appeal Court, all the judges of the Appeal Court as well, right? Then uh, the Attorney General, then the Auditor General, the Election Commissioner, the Inspector General of Police, the Ombudsman, all these big positions in the government were appointed by the President on his sole discretion, literally sole discretion. He could appoint anyone. He could literally appoint anyone. Right now, imagine. Uh, now imagine that I am the president. Right, if I want, I can appoint. Uh, literally, I can appoint anyone as the chief justice just because I want. Right now, let's say that um, if I am the president and I can appoint uh, anyone in this class as the chief justice, as the attention, and that decision doesn't require the approval of anyone and my decision doesn't have to be based on anything. It's simply whatever I want. So what happens when I have that power as a person? I can appoint all these judges, uh, people who are loyal. I can appoint the Attorney General, Auditor General, and Election Commissioner, and everyone, Inspector General of Police, which means that I can appoint loyal people to do all these positions, and all those wings of the government would be under my direct control. The police would do what I'm asking to do, because the IGP is my friend. The judiciary would, would not be independent because all the judges are appointed. By me. The attorney general's department would function under me because I have appointed all these people, right? Auditing won't happen properly. They were my, uh, but whoever the, my government people who are stealing those things would not be uh, revealed because the auditor general department is like under me and all that. So you can see that it was pretty bad. Originally, the constitution was giving so much powers to the president and it was pretty bad. It was not good to the, for the constitution. Right. Now, we are moving on to that story I want to tell you about, the political background. This is where the story gets interesting, guys. Okay. Right. So, let's see how this happened. Okay. Right. Now, since this executive presidency was carrying so much power, 
and as i told you like this was completely against democracy the president has full dominance over the executive full dominance over the parliament full dominance over the public sector over the judiciary and his power is not controlled at all right and this is basically like giving like i don't know like some sort of like an all might is sort of an instrument like it has all the powers basically no one can do anything once someone gets the power of the president so um the discussions started by 1990s that this should be removed the executive presidency should be removed so starting from 1994 in every election in every presidential election in sri lanka the political parties started promising to people that they would uh abolish the executive presidency from sri lanka right so in 1994 for the first time um uh, mrs chandrika bandaran who ran for presidential election gave her promise saying once she comes to power she is going to get rid of this executive presidency presidential system right so much so the jvp candidate who ran in 1994 nihal galapathy decided to pull away from the race and give his support to her on the sole condition that she would uh, abolish executive president right okay so however the problem was once every time a president says that he or she is going to get rid of this position once those powers come to their hand it is very unlikely for them to get rid of the entire thing because there's so much power now i will share uh, a chinese folk story with you guys this this comes in comes in parallel to this right so there's this story in china apparently there was this dragon there was this dragon who used to come out uh come out of a cave and uh, um sort of like bother and like you know to cause damage to uh, people in in these villages okay so he was coming and like breathing fire and like setting houses on fire and killing people and and all that so because of that um so at, at times there were like young young men sometimes um who who like appear to be like heroes and all who had the courage to take like a sword and be like you know what i'm going to go into that cave and slay this dragon down so the only thing is like for years for years they were like very strong guys like saying that i'm going to take down this dragon i'm going to slay the dragon myself and takes a sword and walks inside the cave but they don't they never return right they just go inside they never return and the dragon comes out and kills people and sets villages on fire as usual okay so uh after a while after several years so many heroes going inside the cave and then be not never returning a couple of villager village people have been like uh, you know what why don't we go inside and just see i'm just curious to see how one of these fights happen okay so these villagers have gone and when they are walking inside the cave when they walked inside the cave they've seen <clears throat> they've seen that so many corpses that you expect to see the corpses like the skeletons of heroes right you are seeing like so many corpses and um skeletons of dragons everywhere right so instead of like seeing heroes like dead heroes you are seeing dead dragons so they they had hidden behind a rock and they had observed what happened and they had seen another hero coming with a sword and fighting off this dragon after like a really huge fight finally the hero had managed to slay the dragon down right then after slaying the dragon down there is this big uh like big chair like a throne chair sort of a thing where the dragon sits and after slaying the dragon to celebrate his victory this whole hero goes and he sits on this uh throne chair and the moment he sits he starts getting these teeth coming out starts getting spikes coming out of his body and he turns into a dragon himself right so the village people have realized that 
the heroes have been going in. They have been actually slaying down the dragon. But once you slay the dragon, and when you take the throne, you become the dragon yourself. That's what has been happening all this time. Right? It's not that the dragon is invincible. The dragon can be slain. But everyone who slays the dragon becomes the dragon themselves. Right? So something similar has been happening in Sri Lankan politics because this executive presidency is like that dragon, which, is, which has been causing so much damage to the Sri Lankan political system. And every time a hero walks in to slay the dragon down, they do slay the dragon, but then they become the dragon themselves. So they come to power saying they are going to get rid of the executive presidency. But once they become the executive president, they don't feel like getting rid of them. Okay. So the first time this happened was in 1990s. Now, um, uh, now I am 29 years old. I was born in 1991. And 1994 presidential election is one of the earliest memories I have in my life. So I slightly remember sitting with my parents and like, the election results being on TV, I was like, at least I was like three years old, right? And 1999, there was the presidential election. I was eight years old back then, and I remember that clearly. And since then, I have seen many presidential elections in Sri Lanka, pretty much in every election. This idea of abolishing executive presidency have been there, right? 1994, of course, I don't remember saying that. I just have a distance memory of seeing election results on TV, that's all. But in, since 1999, I remember every candidate saying once they come to power, they're going to get rid of this. But here we are in 2020. Um, I am a political science teacher now, and it's still there, and I'm, I, I'm, I'm teaching. right? So it's very unlikely anyone would get rid of this position once they get to power. Right? So in 1994, once Chandrika Bandaranaika, Ms. Bandarana came to power, she also had the promise to get rid of this. But as usual, uh, it did not happen. And to be to be fair on her side, um, it like at at one instance she did bring uh, a, a suggestion, a constitutional amendment, like a draft, saying that she's going to get rid of executive presidency. But the opposition, Mr. Ranil Vikram Singh, was opposition leader, and they did not support uh, because the amendment said that she's going to get rid of it. But she's going to stay in power for the next few years because she won. Like, it's like this. In 1994, she won the presidential election. So she got this enormous power to her. So in 1997 or 8, she, she's going to get rid of the position. But since she got the power in 94 for six years, she's going to remain the president for the next two, three years. So practically means that after I am done with this position, the position will be no. And it is like, no, no. If you want to get rid of it, like from tomorrow on, it should not be there. So the disagreement was there and it never took off. And, uh, uh, and of course, the legend says that, uh, of course, Mr. Vikram Singh also expected that at one point he'll get that power to his hand. So he sort of didn't want that to go as well. Anyhow, that's, the, that's practical politics. Anyhow, what happened was in the year 2000, something important happened. In the year 2000, uh, Mrs. Bandaranaika's government sort of faced a little bit of a political crisis. Because uh, although, although uh, President Bandaranaika managed to win two presidential elections with a very clear margin, her parliament power never had a clear majority. When Chandrika Bandaranaika was in power, the parliament always had like a very close uh, margin. You need 113 to form a government. She always had like 114, 15, 16, like three, four people jump to the other side, she loses the majority and she can't hold the government anymore. This was the matter. This was the problem. So uh, if you guys have heard of a political party called Sri Lanka, Sri Lanka Muslim Congress, so the Sri Lanka Muslim Congress was founded and led by uh, Mr. H. M. Ashraf. And he was quite loyal to Chandrika Bandar. So when Chandrika Bandar was the president, he was supporting President Bandar. That was one of the reasons she had a majority in the parliament. And in the, in the year 2000, H.M. Uh, Ashraf died of a helicopter crash. And after that, the new leader of the party was uh, Mr. Rao Fakim, who's up to date the leader of the Muslim Congress. So um, he did not have the same level of loyalty towards President Chandrika. As a result, uh, he decided to go uh, and support uh, opposition leader Anil Vikram Singh. 
which resulted in uh, President Bandara Naika's government losing a couple of seats in the parliament. Hence, they had to find those uh, that gap from some other place. So they had one political party looking, JVP. JVP had, uh, at that time, I think they had about seven or nine seats in the parliament. So her government requested, can we have your support to keep this government going? So JVP said that they will support, but they want to see how good uh, her government thinks. So they said, we are going to put you in probation. It's going to be a probation period just to see how we are doing. Because of that, it was known as a probational government. Right? So they said, we have a couple of conditions. There were several conditions. I, I think at that time, there was like a huge uh, uh, drought in Sri Lanka. They were, because of that, uh, like farmers and everyone, they were committing suicide because the, the crops were not that good and they were having a lot of debt. Because of debt, like uh, farmers were committing suicide by uh, swallowing pesticides and all. Uh, so first condition of JDP was like, you need to cut off all the debt that you've given out to farmers because they are committing suicide. So that was done. Um, and there was a list like that. And as far as we are concerned, the most important condition there was that reducing the powers of the executive president. Because it was quite obvious at that time, if you try to get rid of this position, like, it, like it, totally, it's, it's not going to happen. It's going to be like too messy if you ever attempt that. So they were like, let's get rid of some of the powers rather than getting rid of the entire thing. And that's how they passed the 17th Amendment to the Constitution, right? So if you take a look at the 17th Amendment to the Constitution, it reduced the powers of the president in terms of those appointments we discussed above, right? So if you look at this other note, this PDF I sent you all today, uh, in the beginning, I it explains the same thing. The seventy conclusion requires a two thirds majority, and that part. Yeah. So this came in 2000, 2001 during that time. As you can see, if you read the note, the seventy amendment to the constitution came in 2001. During this time, the government was supposed to pass the amendment. You guys know how now. The seventy amendment reduced the power of the president, executive president, by appointing the constitutional council to provide recommendations for president's top level appointments. There are some typos, guys, some like apostrophe, some uh, adjectives are missing, just you know that. And the Constitutional Council is considered tenders. Okay, fine. Once again. Now, this is the idea. <laughs> As I told you, the original constitution said president can appoint anyone to any of these big positions. And his decisions. His decisions are not collective. He doesn't have to ask anyone. He doesn't have to get these uh, uh, decisions approved by anyone else. He doesn't have to take recommendations from anyone. 17th Amendment said, you know what? That is over. You can't be doing that anymore, right? Dear Mr. or Mrs. President, if you want to appoint someone, you have to depend on the recommendations of the Constitutional Council. The 17th Amendment, 17th Amendment to the 17th Constitution established the Constitutional Council, this was an institute which was established to provide recommendations for the appointments of the president, right? So whenever the president appoints uh, people to these big, big, big places, right? As I told you, the Supreme Court judges, the Chief Justice, the Attorney General, when you appoint these people, president can't appoint whoever he or she wants anymore. Now that recommendation has to come from the Constitutional Council. Okay. So now take a look at the note. How many members are there in the Constitutional Council? Ten members, right? The Speaker, the Prime Minister, the Leader of the Opposition. If you'll have a printed note of this, uh, this, this note, printed uh, version, just put a collective bracket to those three and write those were the permanent or ex officio members, okay? Because uh, they, they didn't have to be like specifically appointed as long as you are the speaker, as long as you are the prime minister, as long as you are the leader of the opposition, you get the seat inevitably, okay? Right. Other people, 
uh, one person appointed by the president. Basically, that fellow was the president's representative. Five persons appointed by the president on the nomination of the prime minister and the opposition leader. So basically, the opposition leader and the prime minister have to choose five people collectively. They have to mutually agree to appoint uh, these five people. And once, once the prime minister and the opposition leader nominate these five people, president appoints them to the council. And of course, one person nominated by the members of the parliament representing a minor party in the opposition that does not represent the government or the main opposition. Now we studied about the Sri Lankan political party systems briefly on Monday. You guys know Sri Lanka has a lot of small parties, right? So, you know, there are some parties that have like one, one seat, two seat. So basically, the parliament has to choose one person uh, representing a minor party like that. It can't be from the main, uh, it can't be from the government, either it can be from the main opposition. For example, at, at this time, you have to pick one person, uh, one person from the from a minor party, they can't be from the board to of course because they are the government. Can't be from the telephone either. Can't be from Sajid's party either because they are the main opposition, right? Has to be someone in the opposition but from a small party. Okay, so that's how the ten positions are filled. Okay, this council is chaired by the speaker. Speaker holds the chair and has an official term of three years. This council appoints following commissions for administrative or uh, administration on respective areas. So, so this council similarly, similarly uh, recommending who should handle um, those big positions. They appointed these commissions as well: the election commission, public service commission, police commission, uh, auditing commission, human rights commission, bribery commission, right? Finance Commission, Delimitation Commission, Procurement, and all these commissions were appointed. So these commissions were supposed to handle the administration of each area. Okay, appointments in the police was handled by appointments in the police were handled by the police commission. Right, appointments in the public sector. Not only appointments. There are five things. If you all have uh, a pen and a paper. Write this down. There are five main things that you should be doing. Right? There are five things that you should be, you have to do in the public sector or in the judiciary or anywhere. Five things. What are the five things? Appointments, promotions, transfers, disciplinary actions, and terminations. Those are the five main administrative actions. What are the five? Appointments, promotions, transfers, disciplinary actions, and terminations. Right? So basically, the 17th Amendment wanted to cut off the president's power in handling those. They did not want the president to meddle with the appointments or the promotions or the transfers or the disciplinary actions or the terminations of the public sector or in the police or anywhere. So, if you want to appoint police officers, promote police officers, whatever, it should be done by this independent commission. These commissions are independent. And those members, and those members were appointed by the president on the recommendation of this constitutional council, the constitutional council, those 10 people we count them. Those 10 people would say, dear president, please appoint these three people as the independent police commission. So those three people are in charge of appointments, transfers, promotions, disciplinary action, and termination inside the police. Do you understand? I think it's pretty straightforward. Okay. If anyone didn't understand that, please tell me. I can explain that once more. Right. So other than that, so we talked about the sectors, right? Then you have the Constitutional Council who also provides recommendations for high-ranking positions to be officially appointed by the president. Chief Justice and the Supreme Court judges, right? 
the president of the appeal court and appeal court judges. Members should be members. Huh? Members of the Judicial Service Commission. Attorney General, Auditor General, Inspector General of Police, Ombudsman, and the Secretary General of the Parliament. Right. These positions were, back then they were appointed by the President as per he or she wished. Whoever he or she wanted. Now that's not possible anymore. Now those appointments have to be done by the President based on the recommendations of the Constitutional Council. That's the idea. So if someone asks what, what does the 17th Amendment do? 17th Amendment is actually pretty easy. 19th Amendment is a little longer than this. Right? 17th Amendment, basically what they did was reducing, restricting President's powers on these appointments. Okay? Big appointments. How did they do that? First of all, they made it compulsory for the President to follow the recommendations of the Constitutional Council in terms of these top high-ranking positions. Then also, they appointed these independent commissions to handle the administration of each of those areas. So President's power, President's influence over these areas were reasonably um, restricted. Okay. Right. If anyone didn't understand that part, that's what the entire thing is built on. Huh? So if you didn't understand that, please tell me. I don't mind explaining that once more for anyone who didn't get that. I believe everyone understood. So, um, let's move on. Okay. So, as you guys can see, the 17th Amendment was like really good. It was like really cool. It restricted and it sounds like a really good solution for the problem of like uh, this president, right? It is like a real restriction on that dragon who uh, breathes fire into uh, villages. And to minimize the damage, right? But there was a problem in terms of practical politics. The 17th Amendment, although it was passed, it was never practically implemented. Now, this was a huge problem, okay? Because the 17th Amendment was added to the Constitution. Still, it was not practically implemented. The Constitutional Council was never appointed. When that's pretty much unique, right? It's like, it was like, a set of dominoes. You just don't do the first thing, nothing happens. Like, after that, all these independent commissions or recommendations, nothing came because the Constitutional Council was never appointed. Right? So, because of that, the 17th Amendment was, Amendment was never practically implemented, which is a huge black mark in Sri Lankan democratic, uh, Sri Lanka's democratic uh, uh, history, democracy, uh, history of democracy in Sri Lanka. Because it was a clear violation of constitutionalism. This was a clear violation of constitutionalism as per like the constitution amendment was passed. It was added to the constitution. And this was a part of the constitution which was never implemented. So it was a violation of constitutionalism. Right? So it, it was pretty bad on the political reputation of Sri Lanka. However, it never took off. All the government had to do was not appoint in the constitution comes. Nothing goes beyond from that point. So what happened? Because there is no constitutional council, president continued appointing chief justices and all. President kept appointing like uh, all these big uh, ranks and like none of these uh, independent commissions were in function. And nothing changed. Although this amendment was passed, nothing changed in the country. Right? And it went on for 10 years like that. And to be fair, like even people didn't care much because in the early 2000s, as I told you, like following the Following the 17th Amendment, as I told you, this was because Chandrika didn't have a majority, and it was JVP who pushed Chandrika to pass this point, uh, pass this amendment. And even after that, JVP kept like uh, pushing the government, whereas Chandrika Matayu finally decided to dissolve the parliament and go for an election to find the majority rather than giving in to every time JVP tries to push. So in that election, her side lost, and Rani Vikramasinghe's UNP came to power. So we had a cohabitation now, which means the prime minister was from SLFP. Uh, sorry, you, president was from you, uh, SLFP. The prime minister and the parliament majority was with UN, which means we had the president and the prime minister from two parties, 
which resulted in so much conflicts inside the executive, so much political drama, and this went on until 2004. And 2004, as I told you, Chamjiga Bandar again dissolved the parliament. Then there was a huge power struggle as to uh, the then the, the uh, Mr. Mahindra Rajapaksha or the Chamjiga Bandar Nagar's brother Anurag Bandar Nagar, which person should take the reign once Chamjiga retires and. And people were not sure whether Chandigarh was going to bring a new constitution amendment and get rid of executive presidency and crown herself as the prime minister, right? So there was so much political drama from like 2001 to 2005, six during that time until Mahindra Rajapaksha came to power. Uh, so finally, once for all, like Mahindra Rajapaksha won the presidential election in 2005, and after that it was pretty clear, okay, Mahindra is going to stay for the next six years and. No political drama is going to happen because it won't be a power in terms of power conflict. So political drama sort of ended by the 2005-06. But after that, of course, uh, the war started again. War which had like sort of just like the entity and the government, they were like taking a break from like 2001 to 2006. And uh, the war started off again in 2006 and the war was going on and it was like in the peak years, 2007, 8, 9 were the peak years with the bomb attacks and all that. So people hardly cared about the constitutional amendments being implemented or not, right? It was after the war ended in 2009, when we had a presidential election in 2010, again, this topic of executive presidency being abolished came back to the spotlight, right? So in 2010, Mahindra Rajabasha ran for his second term and the opposition uh, decided to put Sarath Fonseca as the candidate. And Sarah Fonseca's main slogan was getting rid of executive presidents. Right. So, um, yeah, uh, this following that, Mahindra Baksha and Sarah Fonseca yes. was working together no, while, while the war was happening. Yeah, yeah, while during the war, they were working together. Right. After the war ended, uh, the opposition decided because they realized going like anti war is not going to work if they go with a with the campaign, like we are saying no to war and all that, because at that time it was like the war victory was very fresh. And uh, because of that, if you say like no to war and like if you go that way, it's going to be like very unpopular. So they decided putting someone who was equally popular with the conclusion of the war would be like a tactic. So they decided to convince Sarath Fonseca to leave Mahindra Rajapaksha's group and join them and uh, Contest as the presidential candidate. That's what happened. So the main was slogan of Sarah Fonseca. He was, he was pretty much like they were considering. Now at that time, Rani Vikram Singh was not very popular among the Sri Lankans, and it was obvious that because he had already ran twice in 1999 and 2005, and he couldn't be. Um, so basically, they were like, who's like the second famous person at the time? It was pretty much Sarah Fonseca who was the army commander. So he was convinced by UNP and JVP. Uh, to run. And also UNP and JP had to work together because both parties were not politically strong at that time and they needed some outsider to come. Otherwise, like JVP can't come and support Prani Lukumus because he's a UNP candidate, right? So this but was later, the Sarat Fonseca was sent to jail. Yeah, after the election. After the election. Because like 2010 election, we saw um, Mahindra Rajapaksha and Sarath Fonseca going at each other and both are like quite strict and uh, you know what I'm talking about like both are like quite aggressive and strict in terms of practical politics so to be very honest at that time it appeared whoever wins the other guy goes to jail that was like you guys must be like very small back then I was I was doing my A levels I was, doing, yeah. I was like doing my A levels at that time I was in grade 13 and uh, it was pretty much like that. It was obvious that whoever wins the other guy is done. So that was like obvious because both of them were like uh, quite aggressive in terms of politics and the other one won't feel safe. The person who lost staying out. So if Mahindra wins, this one goes to jail and if this one wins, Mahindra goes to jail. That was, that was like the political scenario at that time. Anyhow, in terms of our lesson, what's important is Sarath Fonseca's main slogan was the fact that um, he his main slogan was that he's going to get rid of the executive presidency and create a cabinet system, go back to switch back to cabinet system, which had been like one of the main slogans since 1994, as I told you, right? And even President Rajapaksha, 
who was a sitting president at that time, Mahindra Rajma, who said that even if he wins, he's going to get rid of the executive presidency and he's just going to make that nominal position, whatever. But it was like a, a convincing win for um, uh, a sitting president Mahindra Rajapaksha, he won. And uh, he said that I am going to bring in another amendment to the constitution, the 18th amendment. So as he said, the executive presidency was not taken off. Instead, he brought in the 18th amendment to just struck off, uh, he was struck off, the, this thing was struck off, the 17th amendment was struck off. And the uh, 18th amendment was the replacement. And with that, the executive presidency was even more empowered, right? The position received much more power with the 18th Amendment, right? It didn't make much of a difference because uh, actually the 17th Amendment was never practically functional. So uh, people were saying, uh, people were after the war, there was like some people started saying that, okay, now the war is over. Uh, now just amend, like implement the 17th Amendment because it's a part of the Constitution. It's not nice that for 10 years we didn't implement what is there in the Constitution. It just we were distracted with the war. Now we realize, oh, implement that. And mind was like, just, just hold on because I'm bringing in the 18th Amendment and this is what it's going to do. Okay. So the 18th Amendment, if you go through the uh, note, it says the 18th Amendment to the Constitution in 2010 relocated the powers of the president and replaced the constitution council with less powerful parliamentary council. Okay. So the constitutional council was replaced with the parliamentary council. Right. There's a new note for the 18th amendment. The 17th amendment to the constitution in 2001 established the constitutional council and restricted powers of the president. Of course, uh, although it was never implemented, we are talking with a theoretical perspective. However, this was never practically executed. In 2010, the 18th Amendment to the Constitution was introduced, which restricted the, sorry, it should be, uh, which redirected, uh, there's a typo there, which redirected the powers back to the President and replaced the Constitutional Council with the Parliamentary Council. Right. So if you guys remember, the Constitutional Council had 10 members. Now the Parliamentary Council has five members. The Speaker, the Prime Minister, the Opposition Leader, those three ex officio members are still there, right? Who are the other two people? One member nominated by the Prime Minister belonging to a minor party, one member nominated by the Opposition Leader, right? So those are the five people. Comparing to the Constitutional Council, the Parliamentary Council had very less powers. All the appointments of the top player were done by the President himself, so we are back to square one again. Right? done by the president himself and the parliamentary council did not have the power to recommend people. Also, the following commissions were not appointed by the parliamentary council through the council, though the council recommended members to be appointed by the president. So, these, these seven councils, these councils were there. Public Service Commission, Human Rights Commission, Election Commission, these commissions were there, right? But the president appointed members to these commissions, right? The parliamentary council could recommend people, but the president was not bound to follow this. Right? Now imagine that I am the president and uh, imagine Shamil is like one of the members of this parliamentary council, right? So I have decided to appoint my brother as the chairman of the Human Rights Commission, right? And Shamil and his uh, other people in the parliamentary council tell me, uh, Mr. President, I would like to recommend this person who has been a human rights activist and who has been like an attorney fighting for human rights cases, who has PhD on human rights and who is unbiased, not connected to politics. We feel like this person is like very much qualified to be the uh, chairman of the Human Rights Commission. And I'm going to be like, hmm, that actually sounds interesting. Now nah, let's go with my brother. And I'm going to appoint my brother. And that's how the 18th Amendment reverted all those powers back to the president. Okay. So you can see the parliamentary council was a replacement for the constitutional council. The 10 members became five members. And in terms of powers, first of all, those big positions we talked about, top rank positions, chief justice, and all that. 
none of those were like they are completely they were completely off of the parliamentary office they were went back to presidents and as usual as before and these commissions were there but still the president was the one who appointed members to these these commissions uh, the parliamentary council could recommend but the president was not bound to follow those recommendations right so that's the first thing that was done in the 18th amendment other than establishing a parliamentary council the 18th amendment further empowered the executive president by removing the maximum number of two terms that the president could serve now as i told you guys that by 2010 following the conclusion of the war president mahinda rajapaksha was quite popular among the people very popular so when he started serving the second term he realized that you know what i am quite popular and i can stay in power for longer than two terms so the 18th amendment also included a included a clause saying that they are going to remove that uh, that uh, restriction that says if once you have served two terms that you are not eligible to contest anymore right so the thing is guys like this as you guys can see the 78th constitution created It's like a really powerful president, right? The 78th Constitution gave so much power to the president, and this was the only thing that had like somewhat restriction. Like, okay, you have all the powers in the world. You, if you have served two terms, you have to go home, right? That's it. That's the only thing, right? It's like so basically, the president is like Superman, and it was like the only piece of kryptonite there was. It was like okay, you served two terms. just then you have to go like you know you are done after that and that was also removed so basically this this created a superman who wasn't even weak in front of kryptonite sort of situation right so uh that was that was also removed other than that there's another fact uh, i'm not sure whether it's they are in this note if it's not they are in the note uh, you all may note down that uh, the 18th amendment made it compulsory for the president to visit the parliament once in 3 months at least Every three months, he was supposed to visit the parliament. It was just a minor fact, but include that as well. It is not there in the note. There in the note, they find right. So that's the 18th Amendment, which made the position of the president quite strong. Okay, right. Any questions from the 18th Amendment before we move on to the big one, 19th Amendment? Begin the rest of my. So if the president yeah. passed away, someone in the council will get the presidency. Yeah? president passes away like as if he, he dies yeah 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 no if the president dies according to the sri lankan constitution if the president dies or resigns or if he gets impeached basically if he is removed from the position position immediately immediately the prime minister becomes the acting president the prime minister becomes the acting president he's just the acting president right now let's say let's say if the president wants the president can go on vacation president can go abroad or president can go on like uh, he can take a personal vacation so for that period he is going to put prime minister in charge so prime minister is still the prime minister but we call him the acting president why do we call him the acting president he is still the prime minister but he has the powers of the president right it's like you know when the class teacher goes out and he puts the class monitor in charge so you can call him like the acting teacher for that period doesn't mean that he is a teacher he is a class monitor but like practically he is fulfilling those duties until the teacher comes back so something like that so when the president goes on vacation if he in his absence prime minister becomes the acting president okay so the moment the president dies the moment the president is pronounced dead or if the president resigns or if he is impeached the moment that happens prime minister becomes the acting president that means he is still the prime minister but he is the one who fulfills prime minister's duties so after so that the prime minister also dies i'll have to that in a bit right so if that's the case um if that's the case um again if the president is dead the prime minister becomes the acting president from that point onwards within a month within one month the parliament has to choose a new president out of the members of the parliament so you need to take a vote and appoint the new president within the parliament out of the 225 so what normally happens is the 
the prime minister is the prime minister because his party has a majority right so the prime minister gets uh, the approval so instead of being the acting president he becomes a president now as you said if the prime minister and the president dies together then what's going to happen is the parliament has to have a vote to choose who the prime minister is new prime minister right so the prime minister they have to choose a prime minister and then um that prime minister becomes the acting president then they have to choose a president and a new prime minister okay so it is confusing uh, i think you just ask that out of curiosity you don't need to go that that deep uh, in, as a political student right okay <clears throat> so if that's the case the speaker of the parliament uh, has to handle all the all those responsibilities right so the 19th amendment guys right refer to the note okay 19th amendment to the constitution the 19th amendment to the constitution basically intended to restrict the powers of the executive president this amendment was added to the constitution in 2015 The Parliamentary Council that replaced the Constitutional Council in the 18th Amendment allowed the President to make top-layer appointments by himself. 19th Amendment brought back the Constitutional Council to limit the power of the President, and of course, it goes back to the Constitutional Council, which consisted of uh, 10 members. Okay, now here's the deal. Right? 19th Amendment, what it did was bringing back the 17th Amendment, going back to the 17th, right? So, 17th Amendment brought the Constitutional Council. 18th Amendment changed that to the Prime Parliamentary Council. 19th Amendment brought back the Constitutional Council, and you know, this A was replaced with B, B was replaced with A situation. Okay. So, again, the same thing. Ten members, just like that. And if you if you all can memorize this, there's just one more addition there. Uh, if you guys remember those five people, Prime Minister and the Opposition Leader, continue like sorry. Mutually chose prime minister and uh, uh, opposition leader mutually chose five people, right? So for in the 19th amendment, those out of those five, it was compulsory for two of them to be outside the party. That was like that was the only additional thing in in that area, right? Other than that, it's pretty much uh, similar to the 17th amendment, right? Only thing is 17th amendment said that uh, those five people. Like they, they, it did not specify where I had to choose the five people. So normally five people from the parliament were chosen, and uh, 19th Amendment said out of those five, at least two of them have to be uh, from outside the parliament. That's the only difference. Other than that, nothing much. Okay. So basically, it's reverting back to the 17th Amendment. So again, those uh, top player appointments, right? those top player appointments i told you about the chief justice and the supreme court judges appeal court judges appeal court president attorney general auditor general um igp all these people uh, president could not appoint them by himself anymore um uh, basically the uh, constitution council had to give the recommendation and of course those independent commissions were brought back and uh, members to those commissions over also recommended by the constitutional council and those independent commissions handle the uh, administration appointments transfers promotions disciplinary actions and terminations were done by those independent commissions right now uh, as you can see it, it reverted back to the 17th amendment and there were much more uh, we'll get to that in a bit so what is the political background with this now as i told you guys in 2010 that two terms restriction was removed which allowed mahindra rajapaksha to run for a third term okay so he ran for the third term but not surprisingly with year by year normally political figures with year by year they lose their popularity little by little right normally when someone comes new to power or when you see a new face um uh, it it brings a lot of promise now the fact that Joe Biden is not like a very popular person, but the fact that people don't like Trump so much, and the fact that Joe Biden hasn't been president, so we haven't seen any bad of him. So a lot of people went and voted for him, and after a few years, 
uh, Trump, uh, sorry, Biden is going to lose his popularity. Now, for example, when Obama came, he became as the first black president, uh, potential first black president. And he was like a very smart, uh, like a good orator, like his, his speeches were good and his policies sounded really good. And when Obama first came, the fact that this black person, the potential black person as a president and the fact that he sounds really smart and he's having good policies and all, which like his popularity was like skyrocketed, he was just boosted and there was so much promise when he came. But by year by year, people realized that, you know, things didn't change much. So because of that, in 2012, when he ran for the second term, uh, he still managed to win, but his popularity had dropped. It wasn't like a landslide win like the, the first election, right? Even in Sri Lanka, as you can see now, when Gota Rajapaksha came to power, it was like a lot of like, like people expected in two different extremes because basically pro Gota Rajapaksha supporters said that the, the problems are going to be solved, uh, the development is going to like boost, and the security of the country is going to go like really high. And of course, the anti Gota Rajapaksha people said that no one is going to violate all the rights and like you won't be able to share these memes, political memes, you won't be able to talk in media, uh, like you know those, these uh, white culture will come and like people will disappear and all that. Well, it, it turned out to be that it didn't change much, right? You know, the development didn't really take a boost and neither the democracy of the country didn't really take a hit. So nothing much has changed. And as time passes little by little, year by year, that, that the new face, the, the political value and that attraction, the new face carries, it fades little by little. Okay. So the same thing happened to uh, the senior Rajapaksha also, uh, President Mahindra Rajapaksha. Now, um, in fact, in his case, in the first term, it was the other way. Now, when he came to power, he won with like a very close margin. He didn't have that much of promise. A lot of people didn't really believe that he's going to make much of a difference. Uh, in fact, like, uh, UNP and other parties, uh, especially like the elite class, used to make fun of him, saying he's from a village, he doesn't know much, he's not going to be like a good potential lead and all. But the fact that he managed to finish the war and the victory of war sort of like boosted his popularity and he went into his second term election with so much popularity. Right? So uh, with him, it was the other way around. The same, when his second term started, people believed that he's going to be like like such a promising leader and year by year he started losing his popularity as how it happens to any leader, right? But the only thing was until like 2013, 14, knowing that his popularity has sort of like declined, he wasn't much worried because the opposition didn't appear to be like in any political track whatsoever. Like the political party, the opposition like UNP was there, JVP was there and Sarat Fonseca, he decided to leave all these parties and start form his own party. None of these parties seem to have like like all these parties appear to be quite directionless. And because of that, knowing uh, president, knowing that his popularity is going down, he wasn't that concerned in losing power, especially the fact that there was no potential candidate. It didn't appear to be like, because Pranil Vikramasinghe was there, he had contested twice. It didn't appear to be him getting another shot. Sarah Fonseca, he ran once. He didn't get it. It didn't appear that he's going to get it either. And the other fact was, Arthur was in jail, as, as Shamil mentioned. He was in prison, so he was out of the question anyway. And by, by the time, like 2014, the next presidential election was coming. 2015, 14, the election was coming, the latter part of 2014. Uh, it didn't appear that there was a potential candidate to run as president, right? And I'm not kidding, guys. The opposition even asked Sangakkara whether he's willing to run. I'm not kidding, right? Because like, they couldn't find like anyone else who was popular among the people to challenge Rajapaksha, right? Because Maitri Paras was a minister in point of the government. So obviously Sangakkara turned it down, right? Um, and there were other people that they thought about bringing Chandrika back because Chandrika had already served twice and she wasn't eligible to run. And now the constitution is changed saying that you can run more than twice. She was eligible again. But then again, people like, again, her popularity declined and she's not going to get much of a uh, support. Then they were looking at other options and they realized, okay, you know what, the best thing to do is like taking someone from, from Mahindra's side and turning that person against the Rajapakshas uh, itself. So they went ahead with one of the senior people in Rajapakshas government who weren't really getting what he deserved for 
being a senior now the thing was like president rajapaksha's government was highly criticized for allowing his family members and giving opportunities to his family members and which made most of his party seniors unhappy and uh, maithripal sirisena was one of those people who was like senior he wasn't given the prime minister position um because uh, he wanted to pass it to someone in his family so the opposition knew this so they sort of took him and convinced him to run so he ran against uh, president rajapaksha and when they ran the main slogan the main campaign was the main campaign slogan was this they said that uh maitri balasir said i am not representing a party so he said that i walked out simply because i want to stop rajapaksha's reign right so i am running here people ask like okay you walked out of mahindra's party right you walked out of mahindra's party and are you a member of un right he said no i'm not a member of un i am a non party candidate here i am a common candidate that's what he carried that he said like i am a common candidate he said i am a common candidate for everyone for everyone in the opposition so what i'm going to do here is i am going to run representing the entire opposition everyone in the opposition right then they were like then people are like okay what about if you win what's going to happen if you are not representing the party who's going to be the prime minister then he said my main intention is first i need to finish rajapaksha's reign and second i am going to get rid of this executive presidency which was which was like we're going back to square one again okay, right so i'm going to get rid of executive presidency and then i'm going to retire from politics i'm going to get rid of executive presidency and create a cabinet system again and put mr anil vikramasinghe in charge and i'm going to retire and go to my house in kolonaru and just retire from politics and enjoy the latter part of my life that's what he said that was the main slogan of the opposition right so uh in a very surprising manner uh, um they managed to win in fact right because from the beginning it looked as if lot of people were saying okay maithripal made a mistake he could have stayed in the government and uh, just you know just remain a minister and like he could have just done whatever he gets like true that he won't get to be the prime minister but he could have been satisfied with whatever he gets in my english government he just just jumped into a pit you know jumped in, um, down a trench because he's not going to win that's what it looked apparently because uh, the thing was when maitri balasir walked out of the government as i told you there were so many original slf members who were unhappy with the discrimination they had because rajapaksha was sort of like favoring the ones who were loyal to them and some people were feeling left out and discriminated and uh my tribal expected those people to walk out with him which did not happen only like five people came with him there were there were like 15 20 people who were willing to come who desired to step on the brake because rajapaksha quickly talked to those guys and convinced those guys to stay which appeared as if like you know my tribal just started going in this tunnel and there's no turning back you just have to go knowing it's a dead end that's what it looked like which was sort of taken for granted by the rajapaksha so they did not really run the campaign that well because they were thinking okay this is going to be an easy win but knowing the other side knowing why the people and people knowing that this is a this is an unlikely win they had nothing to lose so they just went ahead full on board and uh, by the last few days it was turning and it was coming to a 50 50 chance but uh, it didn't still it didn't appear as if he was going to win now uh, when this happened i was in university Uh, and uh, i was volunteering with pafra like they are they are volunteering like there's an organization for to make sure that election violence and stuff don't happen so i was in their headquarters i was in charge of like calling the representatives on the field and like reporting if there are any like election law violations um so and my parents did not allow me to stay for back then so like my parents sort of used to uh dictate me back then right so uh, my parents were like you can volunteer in the morning you are not doing the night shift right because you know things aren't that sure because there's a possibility if mahindra rajapaksha wins that he may like you know go into like an emergency rule and then a military rule would come like it was like sort of an autocratic system was poss- possible at that time so my parents were like you know don't stay the night shift just stay there in the morning while the election is happening before the vote counting starts you need to come home right 
so i was there in the it, i was volunteering until like 6 uh, o'clock and once once that uh, that was done i came home so while i was coming home i saw like lot of people like wearing blue caps and holding mindless uh, portraits and all that and getting ready to celebrate mindless win because it it still appeared it was like initially it looked as if like he's going to get an easy win then maitripal was giving a good fight but it appeared as if i was still mind is going to go this somehow but once we came home um we started watching when the results were coming out one by one we realized that the north part and basically the minority ethnicity those majority areas maitripal was winning with like a really big lead in every area he was winning with like 30000 40000 lead while mahinda was winning like the typical rural areas but he's the marginal spot now maitripal was winning like jaffna even like kalambo and all these urban areas maitripal was winning kalambo jaffna and tringo and all those areas with like 30000 40000 lead in each result whereas maitri uh, whereas mahinda was the winning uh, in ratnapura and ponaragala uh, and all those areas smarta and all those areas each area he has about 3000 4000 lead so it appeared as if like you know unlikely but the underdog is going to win so honestly so he managed to win right <clears throat> he managed to win and which happened to be like like a landmark in sri lankan politics if we ignore the fact that his government was quite unsuccessful and there was like a disappointment um the fact that he managed to uh, finish the rajapaksha's reign which uh, not saying whether it was good or bad for the country in terms of a, from a political perspective the fact that it was like a very strong government and it was a very unlikely win that that was a landmark in sri lankan politics right so now since the, now, now that he won now people are curious as to see what happens after this so he, the, the guy said that he is going to um is going to get rid of the executive president and put ranil in charge and retire and go right but then it appeared as if like he didn't really want to stick to that plan because he realized if he does that he is going to become nothing right so he was like um i know that i said that i'm going to abolish this entire position but how about instead instead like you know getting rid of the entire thing how about if i reduce the power uh, power like in a reasonable manner right so since like people like you know something is better than nothing like none of these people have been happening and the executive president have been like a fire breathing dragon ruining sri lanka political culture so if you are at least going to get rid of the powers then at least do that and that's how the 19th amendment came okay so as i told you the first thing the 19th amendment did was bringing back the constitutional council instead of the parliamentary council and the power president had in terms of those appointments were restored to the constitutional council because all the top layer appointments were done by the president based on the recommendations of the constitutional council on the other hand um all those independent commissions were appointed uh, and this time there are a couple of new commissions as well if you all can mention in your answer it's it's great that there are 14 commissions in the 17th amendment there are 14 commissions let's see this note has got it has 13 so one commission is missing somewhere but there are like 14 commissions right there are 14 commissions and all these commissions were appointed they were they were um uh independent commissions and uh, the members were appointed by the president based on the recommendation of the constitution accounts right However, the 19th Amendment to the Constitution, Section 15, which re-establishes the National Council to restrict President's power. Uh, yeah, there's a typo here. The high, however, just you know, the however part. Basically, the 19th Amendment was uh, introduced, and it it uh, restricted the powers of the president. Right. Other than that, it further limited the power of the president by bringing back the maximum of two terms. One of these is one of the first things he did. Uh, so he brought back the maximum of two terms limit. it was removed in the 18th amendment so said that if you have served the presidency twice in two terms uh, you are un- ineligible to run again right uh, bringing back the two maximum two terms reducing the official term for five years and increasing the dissolvable period of the parliament now if you guys remember the original term for a president was for six years 
right? Original term was for six years. So the constitution said that once you come to power, once you uh, take votes as the president, you are they are as the leader for for the upcoming six years, right? After completing four years, you can have a presidential election whenever you want. That's what the constitution said, right? That the four year thing was also added in a uh, in an amendment there. Right, originally it said it is six years, and after the six years, you should be having the next election. Later on, a new amendment was added, I think it was the third or the fourth amendment. Uh, it said that oh, you have six years after completing four years, you can call the election whenever you want. Right, that's why we are uh, the years of presidential elections are quite irregular in our uh, political history. Right, so original term was six years, guys. Okay. So the 19th Amendment reduced that to five years. That's why after 2015, we had the next year election in. Uh, we were supposed to have it in 2020. We had it in 2019, but it is reduced to five years. Huh? And increasing the dissolver period of the parliament. What does that mean? If you remember that we saw um, the president back, even in the original constitution, guys, the president could dissolve the parliament Whenever he wanted, as I told you, like he can wake up in one morning and decide, you know what, I feel like dissolving the parliament. That was allowed because the president could dissolve whenever he wanted. If you remember, there are two restrictions. One is if there's an impeachment motion included in the agenda of the constitution, you can't dissolve. Other reason, other restriction was if the parliament hasn't completed one year. If the parliament is new, it hasn't completed one year, right? Until the uh, parliament completes one year, president could not dissolve the parliament. So, 19th Amendment increased that. 19th Amendment increased that one year period to four and a half years. Until the parliament has completed four and a half years, president can't dissolve the parliament. Right? Uh, side note, guys, it was pretty funny. Uh, it died at the political sense of humor, it was really funny the fact that it was Maitri Pala citizen who brought this amendment saying that you can't dissolve the parliament until you complete four and a half years, and he himself dissolved the parliament in 2018, like violating the law that he created himself. Also, he, he, he himself passed an amendment, 19th amendment, saying you can't get to the prime minister, and he himself got rid of the prime minister in 2018 and appointed Rani Lutum Singh. He got rid of Rani Lutum Singh and appointed Mahindra Rajapaksha again as a prime minister. We have the judiciary had to come and say, no, you can't do that. You can't do that because you yourself wrote these laws, right? So from a political perspective, that was actually very ironic. <clears throat> Anyhow, <clears throat> you can see the Constitutional Council, uh, it comes back to those amendments, uh, comes back to those appointments. The Constitution Council also provides recommendations for high-ranking positions to be officially appointed by the President. You can see the same list again, Chief Justice and Supreme Court judges, President of the Appeal Court and Appeal Court judges, members of the Judicial Service Commission, Attorney General, Auditor General, Inspector General of Police, Ombudsman and Secretary General of the Parliament. These people were appointed by the President based on the recommendation from the Constitution Council only. Right? Then it says also uh, the two terms Two terms the president could serve was removed in the 18th amendment was brought back in the 19th amendment other than uh, that is also limited the president's official terms from six years to five years. Previously, president was not allowed to dissolve the newly appointed parliament for a period of one year. And uh, in the 19th amendment, this period was extended up to four and a half years. Also, the 19th amendment removed the judicial immunity of the president. Now, that's also another important point. Because the original constitution, 1978 constitution, made the president judicially immune. Right? What does that mean? You can't sue the president. Now, this is an important thing, guys. Right? Now, <clears throat> it's like a general fact that in any country, you can't sue a president or a prime minister from an official person. Right? Officially, you can't sue a president or a prime minister. That is done for a reason, because a president or a prime minister can't really make a decision if you are worried about people suing you, right? Now imagine there's a bow, there's a bow and like you have to send your troops somewhere and someone sue you for that, right? You have to forget the fact that you have to be free of the fear of people suing you if you really want to keep your spine straight and make decisions, 
right? Or imagine you decide to start a development project or like build a highway or something like that and that goes through a land of a person. So you have to relocate the person, that, that house and uh, the person sues you for that. So that can't be done. So in, in any country, a president can't be sued officially. But the thing is, in other countries, you can sue these governments, like basically governments and presidents and prime ministers, personally, you can sue them, right? Personally, you can sue them. If you guys are aware, in like 1990s, there was a president called Bill Clinton, right? So the US president was Bill Clinton and he was having uh, an uh, alleged affair with one of White House intern girls called Monica Lewinsky. And there was a sexual harassment case going on where this girl actually sued President Clinton. Right? This girl actually sued President Clinton while President was in office. That, that's because um, that was suing Bill Clinton as a person. You are not suing the US president for something he did as a president. Whatever the activities the president was involved in, this girl, he wasn't involved in those in the capacity of being a president. He was involved in that being a, like a male person. Like a male, like a man. He was involved that as a regular average man, right? He wasn't doing those things as official actions of the president. Right? So she actually sued the US president. It was like making headlines back then, like all over. I was like really small back then. I was like six years, seven years old. So like me hearing people are talking about like Monica Lewinsky and Bill Clinton have something going on. Like I was confused what's going on. Later on, I realized what was going on, right? Uh, when I grew up, like when I was reading the book. So uh, the thing is, you could sue the president like that. And, and uh, it's, it's actually surprising to hear this from like from, for us, for being Sri Lankans. The US president was having financial difficulties because like he had to pay for his lawyers for this case hearing. And he had to get like the best lawyers and they were like charging a lot. And can you imagine the US president having financial difficulties? He was like, uh, like my bank accounts are like actually drying up. I'm actually worried. My salary as a president is not enough. Right? It, it's really funny given like how, because in Sri Lanka, president, prime minister, minister, or even provincial council people, or even these urban council, municipal council, these small politicians, they are like earning in millions. And the fact that financial difficulties aren't really a thing for these. But in the US, the president can be sued by a girl for sexual harassment, and that would pose financial difficulties to the president, right? So completely different political cultures. But the point is like, you can sue people uh, on a, from a personal level. But in, the problem with the Sri Lankan constitution is that it makes the president immune in terms of official cases, as well as personal cases. Now in Sri Lanka, the constitution, you can't sue the president officially. That understandable, of course, that is that as a general thing, but you can't sue him on a personal level also. So if that the Bill Clinton and Monica Lewinsky incident happens in Sri Lanka, right? If one of Sri Lankan presidents sexually harasses a girl or like or assaults someone or kills someone literally, right? You can't really sue the person because from a personal perspective also, from a personal level also, you can't sue. That's called judicial immunity. So that was a problem, right? And uh, in the 19th Amendment, the judicial immunity was removed as in fundamental right petitions. When you are filing a fundamental right petition, uh, that's another lesson in uh, the 78th constitution, which I will teach you on some other day. There's something called fundamental rights, the rights given by the constitution. So if your government does something, if your government does something to violate your fundamental rights, that um, some member of the government, like a public servant or someone, you can file a fundamental rights petition saying my rights are violated. And the Supreme Court would give a judgment saying like pay compensation or reverse the decision of that particular person. So normally, now imagine uh, that I, let's say my rights are violated by a police officer. So when I name the respondents in my petition, I name people in a hierarchy level. Now, let's say, uh, let's say a, a small police sergeant or someone like a lower rank police officer in Patramuna Junction violates my rights. Right? So when I'm filing a petition against him, I'm going to name the respondent, that particular police officer, right? his superior officer in charge, the OIC, the officer in charge of the police station he's serving at, the DIG who's in charge of that particular uh, province, as well as the inspector general of police, 
who is in charge of uh, the entire police force, right? So I, I'm going to name all those people as respondents. That's how the uh, fundamental petitions are created, right? So in some cases, president is the top person, right? President is the top person. So you should be able, uh, you should be able to name president also as a respondent. Now, in practical legal application, that is in practical law, what, what generally happens is uh, now recently I was uh, uh, I was learning about one of these one of fundamental rights cases. Like I was working with one of my friends in the Adventist department, right? So I noticed that it was regarding some race car issue. So uh, they had named respondents including like the sports minister and the sport ministry, uh, some couple of officials as well. But they mentioned in the case that we have simply nominated them as respondents. That's all, right? So the minister would have to like appear or just to, you know, send a notice saying like we acknowledge it, that's all. Because your problem is with the person who violated your rights, that's all. So um, <clears throat> anyhow, in some cases, the minister is the president himself. So sometimes you can't, Name president as a top person because president has the judicial immunity. So under 9th Amendment, that was removed. If you are filing a fundamentalized petition, uh, which is uh, against a ministry which is under the president, you can name president as the final respondent because he's like the top person who is responsible for that rights violation. So that's what you mean by the uh, by by removing the judicial immunity of the president. Okay. Right. What else is there? Other than these, the 19th Amendment also added many provisions on the number of cabinet ministers, formation of national governments, and the appointment method of prime minister, uh, prime minister, etc. Of course, it said that the cabinet should have a maximum of 30 ministers. Because uh, there was a problem, guys. Now, as I told you, Mahindra Baksha, when he came to power, he did not come with like uh, he didn't really come to power with a uh, splash, right? As I told you, a lot of people didn't really believe in him. So at that time, the Sri Lankan parliament was sort of like in a hassle because JVP joined with SLFP and they got some 30 odd seats, 39 odd seats, and they decided to go and sit in the opposition, which left SLFP like very much like depleted. They didn't have enough seats. So when Mahinda came to power, he had like a depleted government parliament and he had a war going. So he was confused as to how to keep the government going because it was like way short of the necessary number, right? Like 30, 40 or people short. So what he did was like invited like sort of like splitting other parties, splitted UNP, took a bunch of UNP people, splitted JVP, took a bunch of JVP people, splitted Muslim Congress, took a bunch of those people, right? So he is sort of like he's like the master of splitting political parties. So he started getting people from other parties. Uh, to join his government. That's how he managed to keep the uh, majority going during the whole period. Right? Now, what is the issue? If you are getting someone from the other party, right? if you are getting someone to leave their party and come join you, they are coming at a price. So, mind had to say that, you know what, I'll take you to the government and I'll give you a ministry. Uh, like then, which means that there are a lot of people who are coming saying that they need ministries. So, and then the other thing was uh, the people we already had in the government, they were like, what about us? If you are not making us government ministers and you are making them ministers, we are going to go to the others. It was like, okay, you also get ministers. You also get a ministry, right? So behind the sort of became like uh, Ofra during that time. Like, you get a ministry, you get a ministry, you get a ministry, you get a ministry sort of thing, right? They had to give ministries to everyone. So during the last few months of war, Sri Lankan Board of Ministers, at like nearly 107 not ministers, right? And since then it became something very general. Being a member of the government meant that you are a minister. So we were sustaining so many ministries. So in 2015, uh, the 19th Amendment took steps to address this. And they said, you know what? You can have a maximum of 30 ministry, ministers, cabinet ministers, 30 cabinet ministers and a 40 uh, deputy and state ministers. So collectively, it's 70. You can't go beyond 70, right? And of course, the third cabinet ministers means including the prime minister and the president, because president is a minister himself. Prime minister also should have a ministry. So uh, including those two, which means you can only have 28 cabinet ministers. 
other ones are going to be state ministers and um, deputy ministers only. All right. So that was also included in the 19th Amendment as to how to uh, what what the, what number should be there uh, in the cabinet. Other than that, uh, the concept of national government came, which we don't have the time to get into today. Right? Forming a national government, how to form a government, and all that. Those things, how to form a national government. Those things are also there. Uh, also about prime ministers, as I told you, um, um, there were like back then. President could appoint anyone he wanted as a prime minister. In his opinion, if the person has, in his opinion, right? That's what the constitution said. Like, if the president uh, feels like this person has the majority, he can appoint that person to be the prime minister. Other than that, um, the president could remove the prime minister whenever he wanted and appoint a new prime minister. And that was changed in the 19th Amendment. So Maitri Pala brought an amendment saying, you can't get rid of the prime minister whenever you want hereafter. And a few years later, he removed the prime minister himself. Right? So it basically meant that back then, like back then, you can't remove the prime minister whenever you want unless the prime minister resigns or a no confidence motion is passed again the prime minister in the parliament. Okay? So that was also a part of the amendment. Then uh, what else? Yeah, remove the power, uh, remove the power of president to the uh, president to remove the prime minister by an order. Of course, you, you can't remove him like that anymore. Increase the age eligibility to apply for position of the president from 30 to 35. Uh, well, if I actually tell you, like, this is a, this is a very, uh, this is a very, this was a very unprofessional move. It was simply made to uh, prevent uh, Amal Rajapaksh from running for presidency at that time. Um, and basically, it was like 30. You have to be 30 years old. Uh, up to run for president back then, and it was increased to 35, and of course prevented a member of parliament being a holder of dual citizenship. This was again uh, to attack Basil uh, Rajapaksha and Gautam Rajapaksha because they were dual citizens of USA and Sri Lanka. Was basically, they were trying to prevent any other Rajapakshas from running for presidency again, uh, and decrease the official term of the parliament from six years to five years as well. So it was also six years at one point. And that was uh, back then parliament's official term and president's official term both were six it was reduced to five years right so that's about the 19th amendment and you all can add what's there in the 20th amendment which was recently passed so i'm going to be compulsory for to include this in your answer but it's better if you can because uh, then that will show that you are updated so the 20th amendment basically brought in the parliament to council again and uh, the Constitution Council was removed, um, and that uh, the appointing ministers and all those things were removed. It was basically uh, going back to the president's uh, old powers as the 18th Amendment. So the 17th and 19th are quite parallel with one another, and the 18th and 20th Amendments are also quite parallel with one another. Right. So that's about all the amendments. If I have another day, I would uh, cover the 13th Amendment and the Provincial Councils as well.